Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni moli wanji, namaste, ciao, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jadley, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. And iHeartRadio Best Kids and Family Podcast Award nominee. We are so delighted that you're part of our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Thank you so very much for being part of our beautiful Reading with Your Kids family. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Ilyasa Shabazz, the daughter of Malcolm X. She is here to celebrate her brand new book, The Awakening of Malcolm X. Before we invite Ilyasa into the studio, we want to invite you to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Please be sure you go there and subscribe to our newsletter. Find out what's coming up on the show. Find out what you may have missed. And also discover all sorts of great do-it-together activities you can do with your kids at home. You can find it all at readingwithyourkids.com. Joining us on the line right now from right outside of New York City. I'm really excited to have our guest on here today. She is the author of the YA title, The Awakening of Malcolm X. Please welcome to the show, Ilyasa Shabazz. Ilyasa, welcome to the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Jack, thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor and a joy. We love nothing more than... Uh, communicating, inspiring um, our young children. Well, I'm really excited that you're here, and I really believe that that the awakening of Malcolm X can be one of those those books that can really inspire our kids, uh, especially our, our our teens. And and I think it's we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this later on, but I definitely think it's something that that families can experience together. Can we begin by just talking about who Malcolm X was? Well, let's see. Um, You know, it was during the uh, 1950s when young people were marching and protesting, demonstrating, very similar to what we experienced this past summer, um, wanting uh, to integrate, wanting a quality of life for themselves, a quality education, uh, quality home, you know, all of these things. My father came along and said, we demand our human rights as your brother. We demand our human rights ordained by God. And he provided um, the biggest critique of America. And he demanded that America live up to her promise of liberty and justice for all. And that terrified people. You know, I think it's so unfortunate that it did terrorize people. But, you know, the the great thing is that um, uh, young people discovered that what they learned about Malcolm X in school was inaccurate. And just this past summer, Malcolm X was quoted 53.7 thousand times per hour in social media. And and so this is the clearest evidence that young people are looking for leaders with integrity. Uh, They're looking for leaders who spoke truth to power and whose works provide uh, insight and strategies that they can employ to meet the systemic challenges head on. I think it's wonderful that young people are attracted to Malcolm because they know he spoke truth. And uh, truth, as we know, is timeless. You know, one of the things that, that, again, hopefully people are aware of Malcolm X, but he was murdered when you were only two years old. How did that affect your your life? Well, you know, I'm so grateful to my mother because, you know, I don't know how she did it because she was a young woman herself. She was just in her 20s and... You know, her home had been firebombed when her husband was alive with her. Um, A week later, um, they went, uh, well, actually, my father was staying at the New York Hilton because he wanted to keep the danger away from his family. And so he invited her at the last minute to come to the Audubon, which today is 
the Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz Center in New York City. And he invited her to bring the, the children along, um, you know, where he was speaking. And I can only imagine how excited my mother was as she, you know, walked into this place, this Audubon ballroom with her children, with her babies. Um, we sat up front stage right and only to witness, you know, this horrific, um, you know, assassination of her husband. And in spite of that, my mother um, raised her six daughters with a lot of love. And it was almost like it was in a bubble of love. Um, and, and I'm just so grateful because with all the love that she gave to her girls, it fortifies me with so much love to not only have for myself, but so much love that I have for others and especially young children. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm imagining if I could find the love in my heart after experiencing something so traumatic, where do you think your mom got, got the strength to really focus in, in raising you and your sisters in that bubble of love? Well, you know, my mother also grew up in the church, um, AME church, uh, as a young girl, um, you know, in my book, Betty Before X, um, it was such a wonderful opportunity for me to go back to my mother's childhood, uh, in the 1940s and, you know, journey along with her as she explored, um, you know, self-discovery, self-love, um, all the things that young girls experience in question. And, and one thing that she learned from her auntie who had passed away was when no one when there are no adults around you that can help answer questions, because we all have them, especially young children, that go, you should go deep inside yourself where God is. And so she established a relationship of God, with God at a very young age. And, and you know, being uh, a young girl growing up in the church around so many, um, you know, her mother was a deacon. Um, her father was, a, her adoptive father was a deacon. Her mother was a Sunday school teacher. They both had graduated from Tuskegee Institute and they instilled such love and care in Betty and faith and determination. And she experienced and witnessed it. She saw how the uh, Housewives League established themselves to ensure that the meatpacking industry hired uh, Black people. You know, she would um, be a part of these meetings that would uh, be downstairs in the living room over lemonade, you know, and I, I, I love these stories that, you know, again, I, that I share in Betty Before X. And so she witnessed women being progressive, um, being strategic, um, accomplishing goals. And she was raised with a lot of faith. And, and one thing that she said often in our household is Ilyasa, just as one must drink water, one must give back. And, and so that's something that I'll never forget. So she was filled with a lot of love and determination and, and all of these things that encouraged um, her children um, to be able to rely on ourselves and, and not um, be dependent on other people's values of us, right? So there was this self-worth. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that's, that's so important. I, I, I think that that's such a wonderful role model that your mom gave to you, just that, that love and that, that self-confidence. And I'm sure that went a long way into helping you become uh, a loving, strong woman. It did. And, you know, it's one of the reasons why I write books. It's one of the reasons why I'm a professor. Um, as a child, my mother decorated our home with our art. Um, she decorated you know, with art that was reflective of who we were, you know, with books and music um, that celebrated who we were as girls and women, as Muslims, as people of the African diaspora. Uh, we had this uh, scholar who used to come to our house, Sheikh Tafik, who teach us history, Arabic, religion, and he'd also do story time, which I loved the most. And it always captivated my attention and my love for books. And so, you know, as a young girl, I remember um, all of these 
you know, wonderful, you know, this wonderful imagination that I had. And I'd write stories. I'd create plays and, and musical productions with my younger sisters and friends in school as the cast. And, you know, one thing is that my stories were always rich and colorful and celebrated my identity. And in retrospect, you know, I'm so grateful to my mother that I had a very healthy sense of myself. And today, it's important, um, you know, to me that young people also have an opportunity to open a book and not only see themselves in the pages, but also learn about history and, 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 and allow them, you know, to feel encouraged to be their best self. You know, my mother always said, Ilyasa, just as one must drink water, one must give back. And I try to incorporate this notion in my stories. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 lo- I love that. You know, one of the things that we say here in the podcast is that parents are the first and most important teachers for the kids. It, it sounds like your mom was not only your first and most important teacher, she sounded like the whole school system she she brought in all these different scholars and wise people to to enrich your lives well honestly my mother was overprotective and and she didn't let too many people too close to us and um um but you know i'm so fortunate and grateful um to Sheikh Tafik he was a scholar um he was one of the recipients of my father's work in the middle east and in africa and so he you know, as a result, learning all this great information uh, felt it almost his duty to, you know, educate Malcolm's daughters. And I, again, am so grateful because I can remember as a child, um, one of our friends, family friends, they were going to Africa and I was absolutely alarmed. I was about six or seven years old. And I remember going to my mother and I write about this in my other book, Growing Up X. I remember going to my mother and saying, mommy, mommy, the Kareems are going to Africa. And she just thought how wonderful that was. But my sister and I, who shared a room together, we used to always watch Tarzan late Sunday afternoons. (laughs) And all I thought is, are you kidding me? Those African people, what are they going to do to my boyfriend, Gamal? You know, (laughs) what are they going to do to the Kareem family? Um, You know, will they have chocolate? Will they have shoes? You know, it was just this this whole um, misinformation, mm-hmm. and and it was around that time that I remember um, Sheikh Tafi coming to our house and teaching us and um, sharing these beautiful um, stories, and and they were actual stories, you know, of Queen Nzinga, of Cleopatra, of um, all of these magnificent women in history that unfortunately our children aren't. Um, exposed to mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. speaking of people in history you you've really dedicated uh, a lot of your life as as a writer to uh, letting folks know and in, in, in celebrating your father's legacy what why do you think it's important that that teenagers today but not only teens everybody but especially teenagers today know about Malcolm X well I think it's important that they know who Malcolm really was, mm-hmm. right? And and I think that that is what happened this summer when they witnessed, um, you know, the horrific killing of George Floyd, that here every human being on this globe is confronted with a pandemic, questioning our mortality. We didn't know what this thing was. Are we going to live? Are we not going to live? And, and you know, being forced to watch this horrific killing of this young, innocent man was horrific. And people, you know, went out into the streets, you know, pandemic or not, in 50 states in this country and 18 countries abroad proclaiming that Black Lives Matter and, you know, recognizing that Black power is not exclusionary. It simply says that, you know, we are a reflection of one another and we are respecting not only your humanity, but we're also ex- uh, 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 demanding respect for our own humanity, that we see each other as a, we see one another as a reflection of ourselves. And I think that that's what's, what's really important. That is absolutely something that, that I've been striving in my life, certainly to teach to my kids 
How do you think? And you mentioned, you know, when when you were a kid, you know, watching the Tarzan movies. There's so much in our media that that kind of gives us a, a distorted view of each other. How do you how do you think families can 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 battle that? Well, you know, Jack, this is what it looks like when we control the narrative of our of our stories, and you know why I'm always so honored. Um, to be amongst authors, you know, amongst those who are creating, amongst teachers who are instilling values in our children. I'm grateful that both of my parents, Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz, challenged systemic racism and, and that they understood the importance of our educational curriculum to be based on historical facts so that For example, each of us understands that African-American history is American history Mm -hmm. and that American history is also Hispanic history, Native American history, Asian history. And that if the terrorism of slavery and the massacres of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma and Rosewood, Florida are taught in high school U.S. history classes to be as American as the Boston Tea Party, the more citizens, our children, parents, we'd understand the necessity for reparation. We'd have the opportunity to provide a value system without teaching our children hate and discrimination and racism, but rather we're teaching love and respect. You know, we're providing them with a value system of truth, honesty, human compassion. And, you know, this is what controlling the narrative looks like when we participate in this uh, education curriculum, so to speak, so that all of our children are benefiting and 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 thriving and loving themselves and respecting others. You know, one one of the things that 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 you talk about in the Awakening of Malcolm X was that your your dad had a a lot of criticism about the prison systems. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, listen, you know. Um, There are approximately 3 million inmates, right? 3 million people behind bars. And Brian Stevenson, who I admire tremendously, attorney Brian Stevenson with the Equal Justice Initiative, he says that we are so much more than the worst mistake we've ever, than the worst thing we've ever done. And um, that we will not be judged on how we treat the rich and the celebrated, and I'm paraphrasing, Um, but that we will be judged on how we treat the poor, the marginalized, and the incarcerated. Are we helping to provide a curriculum or something that is rehabilitative? When my father was in jail, he was very fortunate that the, the jail, he went to one jail that was horrific, and he was mortified. And then he was transferred to another jail, and he only went because his uh, aunt or his sister, Ella Collins, said to him, the library is superior to the library where you are because Malcolm was an avid reader. And so he agreed to go to this other um, facility. And it just so happened that this colony in in Norfolk, Virginia, was also an experimental rehabilitative prison. And it was like a college campus. You know, they had their own rooms. They had working toilets in their rooms. Um, They had this um, stellar library, and Malcolm studied and read just about every book that one could imagine. And also that Malcolm um, studied the dictionary not because he couldn't read or write. He studied the dictionary because he wanted to know the etymology, the root word of all the words, so that he could be his best self, and he was a star debater. And so today, in 2012, There are, um, the prison population is increasing by 700%. We are spending U.S. taxpayer dollars, $80 billion, $80 billion U.S. taxpayer dollars on building correction facilities. And, and, And this kind of money could help parents offset you know, their children's tuition, their college tuition, it could allow us to have, uh, you know, a greater investment in our children's um, at school activities, after school activities. And, and so, you know, it's just a matter of when we know better, we do better. 
because, you know, at the end of the day, as my father said, um, when he recited uh, Shakespeare, to be or not to be, whether it is noble in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms a bit against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. We're going to either be a part of the problem or a part of the solution. And I want to be a part of the solution. I do, too. Yeah. I do, too. I do, too. Hey, you know, um, what we, we, we celebrate the fact here that, that books can be uh, mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. That, that books are a great way for for kids to see themselves portrayed positively in the pages of books. It's a great way for for kids to see others and to see the humanity in others. And it's a and books can be a great way for for people to come together. What do you want kids to to take away? from the awakening of of Malcolm X? I just want young people to be inspired and to recognize that they have the power to be and do whatever it is they want, that they are worthy, you know, of self-love, that they are worthy of a quality education, and that they are worthy to participate in mainstream society however they desire. Right. Just as long as we are providing a great value system for them. Right. They they see us and they are a reflection of who we are. Right. We can't complain about young people because young people mirror who we are, who their parents are. And so we want to make sure that we are instilling those good values in them so that they know that they you know, can be and do everything. Yeah. Obviously, this is a great book for, for a young teen to, to read on their own, but I think that this would be a fantastic book for a family to read together or co-read and come together and, and, and talk about it in the van on the way to school or over dinner. What do you think um, uh, families can, can talk about if they're experiencing the awakening of Malcolm X together? Well, I think the lesson always for our young people is that unity and moral character matters, right? Not divisiveness, not cheating, not lying or stealing, but that character is vindicated in the end. Cheaters only lose. Yeah, that's that's powerful. I love that. Cheaters only lose. Wow. I, you know, I recently, I, and, and this is, you know, has no, nothing to do with the awakening of, of Malcolm X, but I recently watched One Night in Miami. Um, on HBO. How did you, what, what's your take on that, on that film? Well, you know, listen, I thought it was a great um, way of introducing Sam Cooke, mm -hmm. right? Uh, of introducing Malcolm X and Jim Brown and Muhammad Ali. Um, but I think that, you know, after the summer that now we have matured, right? And that it would have been even more empowering and inspiring had we showed the challenges that these men really confronted and the opportunity they had to come together and discuss these really ch challenging issues. We'll, we know that Muhammad Ali um, was mentored by Malcolm X. He would have never drank any alcohol and especially sneak behind Malcolm's back. Right. What kind of values are we really showing? Muhammad Ali didn't drink. Mm -hmm. And and, um, you know, and Sam Cook, look at this song that he wrote. A change is going to come. So we know what was on his mind and what you know, he wasn't so much of a, um, you know, a, a prankster. And, you know, I don't know. I just saw them being a little immature. I I. I thought that it was an opportunity to do to bring more to the screen. But I think that um, if we're going to look and, and, and praise what we see, I think that it was a wonderful film that introduced uh, four gentlemen that had an opportunity to come together and, and exchange their pains and exchange their strategies. I, I guess the last question, you know, this has been an, an issue that I've um, been, been watching and been hoping and, and in some ways helping to to have people see each other as as kin as as family are, are are we 
are we going to be able to make that change? Do you, do you find hope that, that, that someday that our nation will be able to live up to its promise? I do, as long as we're willing, you know, as I said, we're either going to be a part of the problem or a part of the solution. There are eight, what is it? I think it's 8 billion, 600 million people in the world. You mean to tell me that we can't make a difference? Of course we can, because there are more good people in the world than there are bad. And, and, you know, even Dr. King had a special relationship with my father. Mm -hmm. And even though their philosophies varied, their respective moral principles enabled them to unite and work for the best interests of their people. Of 22 million African Americans, both set out to strategically improve the quality of life um, all of which were was embodied in the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And if two human beings with all of these challenges against them were able to make a significant contribution, imagine if we simply said, I am going to be a part of the solution. All we have to do is come together, not focus on the divisive tactics, unfortunately, um, but focus on you know, how can we be supportive of one another? And I think, you know, it all starts with that education, mm -hmm. you know, understanding that we are a reflection of one another. And if we're teaching our children how to love themselves, then they have enough, um, uh, you know, they're, they have the capacity to love others. And, and it's the reason why I do my work. I look at children and I love them. I love them wholeheartedly because I love myself. If I didn't know how to love myself, how am I going to love anybody else? So I think those kinds of values that my mother and my father ensured were instilled in, in their six daughters um, is what uh, grounds my work and, and fortifies my commitment. Wow. And this has been uh, just a, an absolutely wonderful experience for me. Could you tell everybody where they can find out more about you and also find out more about the awakening of Malcolm X? Sure. Um, so I'm more, I love my Instagram. It's so funny. I wake up early in the morning and I'm like, ah, you know, I'm, I'm posting <laughs> these things. I'm, I'm being mortified sometimes by looking at some of the things that I see when I especially see the killings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I see the beautiful children, I'm just excited and um, so I'm on Instagram, Ilyasa Shabazz. I'm also, I have a website, ilyasashabazz.com. If you can't spell my name, you can go to growingupx.com. It's, you know, the same. Um, um, and The Awakening of Malcolm X is uh, Macmillan Books, um, which FSG is the children's book version or, or conglomerate, I guess, you know. And, um, and they can, all of my books uh, can be purchased uh, online, Amazon, or you can go into a bookstore and um, and get it there. Yeah, and we absolutely are encouraging folks to support their local businesses, local bookstores, and if they don't have The Awakening of Malcolm X on the shelf, you can just ask them very politely with lots of love in your heart, and I'm sure they'll get it there for you in a day or two. We've had a wonderful, wonderful and really eye-opening experience talking with the author of The Awakening of Malcolm X, Ilyasa Shabazz. Ilias, thank you so very much for spending this time with us today. Thank you, Jed. It was such a it was such a pleasure. And you know, God bless you for your work. I think it's just so wonderful to have a a, um, a, a moment, you know, where you can continue to inspire the young people and even their parents. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast. It's a double header day. Amanda Lauer will be here along with Carolyn Asphalt. That's the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to thank our guest, Ilyasa Shabazz. Be sure to check out The Awakening of Malcolm X. I also want to thank my team, Alejandra Doherty, Fatima Khan, Alexia Brown, Hannah Pat Hope Boisky. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. I want to thank Augie the Doggy for having my back here in the studio. But most of all, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Bye.